Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, the book of St. Matthew. The Gospel, that's the good news or God's spell, an old Anglo-Saxon word. And how precious it is, the coming of the Savior, the promise made by Almighty God from the Old Testament. And in the teaching of this, we... Um, Levi, being one of Matthew's names, wove in a great deal of the Old Testament. We, have, we had begun in chapter 3 in the last lecture, and it was concerning John the Baptist, this one crying from the wilderness. And it has to do with, um, uh, he was in, as it states in Luke chapter 1, verse uh, 15 and 16, John was not Elijah, but he came in the spirit of Elijah. And how precious it is that we know that Father never forgets about us. And in the last chapter of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, it states, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all they that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that, um, that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them uh, neither root nor branch. This, this has to do with the rudiment, how, how the, meaning there's not going to be any evil after the Lord returns. They're either going to get their act together or they're not going to be. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. That's you. You love him, you serve him, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. And how precious that is. And then in the completion, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And yet future even. And how precious that is. So that was the beginning of chapter 3, the great book of Matthew. Let's pick it up in chapter 5, verse 5, rather, of chapter 3. And we'll take it from there with a word of wisdom from our Father. Verse 5 then reads in chapter 3, then went out of him Jerusalem. Then went out of him uh, Jerusalem, and um, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan. They went out to him from Jerusalem, and uh, how precious it is that his fame here. He's hardly started, and John the Baptist is is. Um, doing the, the baptism and for forgiveness of sins and having been born six months before Christ was, naturally his ministry began before Christ did. And here he is, uh, ver what is he doing? Verse 6, And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Confessing them, having them washed away. That's what baptism does. Uh, verse 7, and when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, that means you offspring of vipers, uh, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And certainly, um, uh, old John the Baptist didn't cut any, um, any slack. And, we know this generation of vipers, the offspring of, that's a, that's a serpent. And this goes all the way back to the first prophecy in the Bible, chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, where, where our Heavenly Father states to the serpent himself, from which they're an offspring, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. You shall bruise his heel, and they were, they were nailed to the cross but he will bruise your head. He's going to bust it. But that won't happen until the end of the millennium. So, uh, so, so John is bringing forth, and he, he wasn't bashful about identifying 
the Kenites that showed up during the baptism. You see, anytime you have a large ministry that begins to grow, you're going to have certain ones will show up, uh, of um, some many times Kenites, to to be inquisitive, to see what's happening, because you're pulling people away from their set up organization, verse eight, churches I should say. Bring forth therefore fruits meet, meet for repentance. Let, let me see some evidence that you're fit to be baptized. And so it is naturally, if they're the offspring of the serpent, is it possible that they can find salvation? Absolutely. But they've got to convert. That takes some doing. They don't usually do that. Verse 9, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Well, what does... Uh, so that you understand what uh, John the Baptist is saying here, what, what, does the, what does the name Abraham mean? Abraham means the father of many nations, or he would bless many nations. He was to be a blessing to all. Why? Because Christ would come through that lineage. And this one that is about to show up here to be baptized, uh, Jesus Christ himself, was the reason that he made that statement. But what, what he's saying here, through the cruci crucifixion, those that would believe upon Messiah, I don't care what tribe, what creed, if you believe upon him, you are a child of God. Because the Son of God, being Emmanuel, God with us, when you convert to him, you certainly are his children. Because you know something, this may surprise some people, but... Um, there are no souls on this earth that were not created by God, even Satan's. God, in the day that Satan was created, a cherubim, God still was the creator. But God does not, um, uh, he gives free will, and unfortunately some go bad. Satan was certainly one of the first. Verse 10 to continue. And now also the axe, John the Baptist talking to the Kenites, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And in chapter 7, 19, Christ himself would do this concerning trees that don't produce fruit. Be being people, you, you don't produce fruit. Um, that is to say, plant a little seed. It might just be a smile to someone showing them that that um, you serve the living God, and it shows. You don't have to advertise it, it shows. But um, th here, here, this is very offensive, though, to the mucky ducks who work themselves into titles of the church, so to speak, even um, uh, some in, of the chief priest were unfortunately pretenders. Nothing new under the sun, what? Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that fire is the Holy Spirit, and God is a consuming fire, but that fire warms your heart. It glows upon you, but to the wicked, it is a burning fire. Um, and by that, um, God is our judge, and so it is that he will continue being exactly that. Uh, but what he's speaking of here is Christ himself. J well, how would John know that? Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, it's written in the Old Testament, verse 12 whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. That's the thrashing floor, and that's a winnowing fan. And gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, it, it's always well to know agriculture, because without knowing 
a little bit about agriculture, it's pretty difficult to understand that. But let's, let's, let's talk about it a moment. Let's say in the old, now we have modern threshing machines and so forth, but in the old days, you had a winnowing fan for what purpose? Well, let's say you would take a burlap bag and let's say uh, you could put, let's say some dried black-eyed pea uh, pods or wheat, whichever, chaff of wheat. And you put it in the bag and then you take a, a stick and you beat that bag until you break the grain loose from the hull. And then once that is done, the, if the wind isn't blowing, you have to provide a breeze and the winnowing fan blows the shaft away and the heavy grain falls on a, a blanket or a container, a basket or whatever you might have, and it separates the wheat from the chaff, the black-eyed peas from the hulls. It's that simple. Uh, many of us of my age have, have done this uh, in uh, preserving dried uh, uh, vegetables, such as black-eyed peas and wheat itself. Now, thank goodness, we do have modern equipment that um, is amazing how it can, but this, this is what it means. Christ has that winnowing fan. He can plead with you. It, it is opposite of the analogy or as the analogy of, of the fisherman or fishing for men. You, you, you gently bring them in. Well, so it is with separating good people from bad people. You see, Christ can read minds even. So bad people can never lie to Christ because he even knows what they're thinking. So there, there you have it. He said, it's, it's going to happen. We're going to separate. There's a day coming. And I tell you again, it is to this day. That day is coming, and he that comes at the second advent, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be riding a white stallion this time, um, the analogy, carrying a rod of iron, not being born to babe to be crucified, but to put things in order, and in order he shall. Verse 13, to continue. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Well, now, what is this? Why would Christ have to be baptized by John? Christ is a teacher. He, he always proves the way for us. He, he parts the waters where all you have to do is follow. And he's giving you an example. You might say, well, should I be baptized? Well, Christ was. Or do you think you're better than Christ, that you need not be baptized? Uh, and, and so it is uh, that Christ was setting the standard and the way. Verse 14, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? Um, he, John was uncomfortable with this, and I, I can understand why, and certainly you can as well. 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. In other words, to show the way, to lead. You know, a leader leads. And... Um, and, and he was certainly a leader of leaders, and John being one of those leaders also. Verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he, and, and he saw the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And uh, verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, many people do not understand baptism. This pretty well explains it. He came up from the water or out of the water. There is no, uh, many people think, sprinkling and some submersion. submersion. The word baptize itself, or baptism, the etymology of the word 
comes from uh, bibto to take like as if you would take a piece of white linen and you want to dye it red. So you would take water and put the color from berries or whatever the case may be. You would naturally have to submerge the whole cloth to saturate it, to bring it up whereby it would be red rather than checkered or spotted or something of that nature. So the word baptism itself being properly translated gives answers the question as far as baptism is concerned. No questions asked. But the beauty is that God himself, the, the, the office in heaven, the full Godhead, saying, this is my beloved Son, the only begotten, in him, which is to say, God will never ask you to do something he hasn't done himself. Hebrews chapter 2 documents this, uh, stating that he came here to die on the cross for what purpose? To defeat death, which is to say the devil. Okay. And through <clears throat> this also, bringing salvation for whomsoever will. So this, this um, identifying him beyond any shadow of a doubt to the miracle child given Elizabeth and Zechariah, which was John the Baptist when they were too old, and giving this son to Mary, really too young, not married yet, this virgin conceived and brought forth the very Son of God. And God himself was willing to say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he had a right to be pleased because he would set the way and pave the course. And so that's what he was doing. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Again, well, why would Christ need to be tempted of the devil? To show you how to get it done. You're going to be tempted of Satan in many ways in your life. Okay. You see, he, he's very intelligent. He knows the Bible better than most people. I assure you. He can quote it better than most people. And, and as well, he knows your weaknesses. And boy, can he take advantage of those weaknesses when, when you let him. If you're a believer, and if you follow the path Christ has shown us, you know exactly how to handle him. Because as it is written in the great book of Luke, in chapter 10, along about verse 19, Christ gives us power over all of our enemies, including Satan, the serpent. And so uh, when you put up with it, it's your own fault. It means you're unlearned and you don't practice what, what Christ is showing here. There's no one with him other than Satan himself to show you he doesn't need an army. He doesn't need help. He can handle business himself. How does he do it? Well, this is the method you use. Verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, don't you try that. He did. He was afterward and hungered. In other words, he had a weakness and Satan knew it. Okay. I mean, if you go 40 days and 40 nights, if that were possible and it was for him, you would be very hungry. Verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And uh, the old tempter, knowing he was hungry, takes advantage of that weakness. Uh, only there was no weakness in Christ. Verse 4, But he answered and said, this is the words of Christ, It is written, that's the answer to many of your problems. You want to think about it. It is is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. I mean, Christ made no bones about it. You, you do not live by bread, but by every word of God. And do you know what? Satan had standing before him the word of God. 
the Word became flesh, as it's written in St. John chapter 1, and be, the Word became flesh and walked among us. This was the living Word. And Satan trying to tempt him? You bet, Satan. But this is your, this is your road map, and this is what can happen to you. And Christ is showing you this is the way you handle it. Well, how, how did he say that? By the Word of God. God's Word gives you power over all your enemies, if you have faith. Verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, that's Jerusalem, of course, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, I mean, right up on one of the highest parts. Verse 6, And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Cast thyself down, for it is written. Whoa, look at this. This is Satan himself saying it is written. How would Satan know? He knows the word. It is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Isn't that wonderful? Satan is repeating scripture. Well, it's not so wonderful. Why? He misquoted it. How many Christians can read that and know it's a misquote? And how many Christians know Satan will do this to you over and over and over if you allow it? So, well, how, how could we find that out? Well, all you would do is go to Psalms 91, check it out. Find out what God really said. And you will also find out why Satan really wants to destroy him. And, and you find that um, in chapter 91, the great book of Psalms. Let's pick it up with the 11th verse. What does it say? For he shall give his angels charge over thee. Now, Satan had that right. To keep thee in all thy ways. Now, that's where Satan went wrong. In all your ways, he was the way, the living way, the way you're supposed to do. God will always take care of you. But Satan changed that to at any time, like it's a circus sideshow. <clears throat> Jump off of that tower. Put on a show. That wasn't Christ's way. Christ would have been out of the way. So Satan twisted the scripture from to keep thee in all thy ways to at any time. Not at any time is going to cut it with your father. He has a plan. It's written. Have you read it? That's what this is all about. Have you read it? It is written. Verse 12 to continue. Let's, let's understand why Satan would be drawn to this particular chapter. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And it's true that in the way they will do that. But they do not put on sideshows for Satan or some person trying to prove something religious, religiously or otherwise. Verse 13, this is why Satan dreaded it. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and Adler. Adler is a serpent, and that was Satan. The young lion and the dragon. The dragon is his head honcho, Satan's main office. Shalt thou trample under feet, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall come unto me, upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And so it is that Satan would really love to have twisted that to his own benefit. To put a, you know, uh, this would be the equivalent of somebody saying, God, I really want to believe in you, but there's a stream here. Dry it up a minute so I can walk across dry. That, that is so silly. If you have to have something like a sideshow to give you faith in God when it is written, the beauty, the things he has done, 
and the things he's going to do. If you need a little personal sideshow, you're probably going to hell. Okay. <clears throat> because that's an extreme lack of faith. So what you see here is not only does Satan know Scripture, but he knew that that same Scripture stated he was going to get his head busted, that it was Christ's feet that would trump him, that would put him out of business. And, and uh, he, he's well versed in it, and so it is. I don't know, are you, do you want to, we want to remember, Christ is doing this. Is it not strange that the first person that Christ actually ministered to was Satan himself? <clears throat> it was in a debate. But Satan had the first off audience, basically. And for your benefit, so that you would know how to react, and so it is that... Uh, God would protect you as he protected Christ, as if Christ needed protection. Let's go with the next verse, verse 7. In, in this fifth chapter of Matthew, Je I'm sorry, fourth chapter of Matthew, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 6.16, and don't forget it. Don't try to tempt God to put on a sideshow so it'll strengthen your faith. It's written, read it. It will strengthen your faith. It will refresh you. It will pick you up. Verse 8, And again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. <clears throat> Excuse me, now I, I want to know how sharp you are. What did that say? Did it say the kingdom of heaven? No, it did not. Satan doesn't control heaven. It was, heaven wasn't Satan's to give to him. But the ways of this world, and, and not the spirituality of it, but the false religions, the false leading in the kingdom that Satan was the prince of the air. He could have given that wickedness to Christ. It was his to give. Your governments of the earth, not the kingdom of heaven, but kingships here on earth. What did Christ tell him? Verse 9, And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee. This is what Satan continues if thou wilt fall down and worship me. I'll give you the whole thing. Was that tempting? I mean, would that tempt the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you know it wouldn't, and I know it wouldn't. But how many would it tempt in this world today, which is what Christ is doing? He's showing you how to avoid Satan, how to keep away from him, how to handle him. What would Christ say? Verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And of course, uh, that would be Deuteronomy 6, 13, as well as Exodus chapter 20, the first commandment. And uh, certainly, where, well, where is Satan? He's behind him. Get behind me. And that's where he's helped even to this day, physically. Not his spirit. His evil spirit romps this earth anytime he so chooses. But is still controlled. And you have the ability through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to tell him to get hints, to get away from you, to, to um, leave your house, your home, your family, your business, whatever. You have that, you, that you have control over, you control. You don't let Satan control it. You don't worship the false Christ, you worship the true Christ. That's what this experience was about, was leading you to the true Lord Jesus Christ. Not the fake. You had both of them right here together. In the near future, you're going to have one of them back. Well, which one will it be? It is written, haven't you read it? The false one comes first. In the sixth 
trump. The sixth seal and the sixth vial, that's 666, any child can count from one to seven. But uh, there you have it, that uh, that one will come first, then will come the Lord Jesus Christ. However, the Lord did us a great favor. He sent us the Comforter, which is to say the Holy Spirit is always with us, even though the false one is here. And he intends to speak through you. You're not to premeditate. He'll do the talking. What? It is written. Well, where is that written? Mark chapter 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. So you wouldn't miss it. But that's what this example was about, showing you how to overcome Satan and to show you what a scripture lawyer Satan is. He can take scripture and twist it 45 to 90 degrees to throw it totally off and make it false, even though he's quoting from the Word of God. A good Christian needs to know what the Word says. It is written. Have you read it? Let's go with one more verse, please. Verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. He, he hadn't eaten for 40 days. They fed him, took care of him, and Satan had to return where, to where Michael, even to this day, as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, whereby he controls him there until it's time for him to be cast out as the false one. How precious the Word of God that he allows us to understand the Word, to not be tempted by Satan's excuses, his poor imitations of teaching God's Word. When you are read and you know the, the simple truth that God gives us, you are not going to be deceived. That's why God has set aside His election. That's why He can trust them, love them, and honor them as they honor Him because they know the Word of God. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. Why? We don't have that right. We have one judge, and that's our Heavenly Father, and He is judge of all. You do have the gift of discernment, which is to say God-given, giving you the right to discern whether something is true or false. And that is your prerogative, and God knows that uh, if you have read as what is written, that you are able to handle that. Now, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. You've got a prayer request. You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Right now, He knows what you're thinking. So what you have to do is let Him know you love Him. That's the main thing He wants from you is your love. Document that. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace. That is to say, your love, your mercy, whereby... Uh, it is returned. Why? He's your father. The closest relative you will ever have. 
So naturally, you should let him know you love him. Talk to him. That's what he wants. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with uh, Luann from Iowa. The Bible tells us if you have enough faith, you can drink poison and it won't kill you. You can handle snakes. I don't, it, it didn't say they won't bite you, but you will not die. Do you think anyone today has that much faith? Well, they would be kind of ignorant if they did. Okay, and I'm not talking down to you, but those are analogies. You know, you go out here and get one of these old timber rattlers. They haven't read the Bible. Okay. And, and God created them to be able to protect themselves. They'll give you plenty of warning. Don't mess with me. And then if you do, they're going to hit you if they get a chance. Now, we have hypnotists that can pretty well go up because snakes also hypnotize to catch their game. But all, all this means is that picking up serpents, the serpent is Satan. We just were covering it in the fourth chapter of Matthew. It means that your knowledge is superior because you've risen to a higher level of thinking by knowing what is written. And what it means is you can handle Satan without any problem. Why? Because Christ gives you power over him. And then, what about this drinking poison? If you drink poison, it will kill you. It is another analogy or a figure of speech that means your reputation will withstand whatever the Kenite might want to put out against you. You can pass muster. You'll do just fine. So you see, it doesn't have anything to do with picking up serpents. It doesn't have anything to do with drinking poison. It means that you're equipped with the load of the, and loaded with the Word of God whereby you can handle basically any situation. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be error, and that means it doesn't mean there's not going to be pain. But it means you can cut it. You, know, you, can, you can handle it. They may put you down a little bit, but God will always pick you up. And you end up being superior, and you never have to worry about that. Our Father takes care of business. Tony from Canada. The Bible says we should love our enemies. I was a soldier and I have a hard time with this. What should I do? Well, <clears throat> to love your enemies. The child, the Bible also says you should love your children. But if you spare the rod, you don't love them. That means you must discipline and correct and lead and guide just as Christ leads us. But have you never read Psalms 144, the soldier's prayer to God, to give you strength, to stomp on your enemies, to overcome them, to be your strength? You see, God expects Christian men and women to protect their families with whatever it may take. Loving your enemy, it may take a two before to bat him right up beside the head, okay, to give him an attitude adjustment. You, you, the enemy may need to put him out of his misery if, if it's on a battlefield and he's trying to kill you or your friends. It's um, like a great general once said, you do not volunteer to die for your country. You volunteer to make the other guy die for his country. Okay, Because God gives us the ability to use your mind. And we still have problems, but... Uh, how honorable it is when one does protect this nation, a Christian nation, a nation that gives this or this Shepherd's Chapel license to broadcast to the world. It's our freedom of religion, a freedom of speech, of being allowed to do that. It came at a price. Yours truly has even shed blood on the battlefield for that purpose. I don't regret it. I don't deny it. I will wear it as a badge of honor to be able to defend this great nation, though sometimes we have falseness within it, but still a great nation that allows the Word of God to go forth. Uh, don't you ever feel bad, Canadian. You stand proud. You're a soldier for a country that definitely deserves defending. 
Deller from Oregon, in the millennium will the earth still have storms and, and tornadoes and so forth, but since we will be in spiritual bodies, it won't hurt us. In the millennium, we will still have storms and tornadoes, uh, because, and, and as you state, we're all in spiritual bodies, so it does, it, it flame that you would call fire today does not bother a spiritual body. But the, the rejuvenating of the earth does not take place until the last day of the millennium. And then after that, then the firmament will go back in its original position and this is going to be one fantastic place in the third earth age. It begins at that time, as it is written in Revelation chapter 21. Not a new earth, but the word is to rejuvenate this earth. It's a fantastic planet. Uh, Bob from Indiana, I would like to know more about God's real name. Are we being deceived by calling him Jesus and what... Um, that means, and Lord, also do you have anything on marriage? Well, all of God's word has to do with marriage, as it is written in the very beginning when Adam was, Eth Ahadam was created, that he was to leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and, and begin his own family. That doesn't mean you're to disrespect your uh, parents, but uh, you diligently take care of your own family. The true name of our Heavenly Father, he gave it to Moses. He said, uh, I am Yah. And the etymology of it is, is I am that I am. Iya asha iya in the Hebrew tongue. Which, you see, if I use a different language, it still says the same thing. And as a teacher, I must use all of the languages to teach the name properly. The Son being Jesus, or Christ, which is Christos, what does that mean? It means the Anointed One. But when you say Jesus, you are saying Yeshua. And Yeshua being translated or said in the Hebrew, which it, that is the Hebrew, or, uh, it is to say um, Yahweh's Savior. And Yahweh is the true name of the living God. But uh, naturally, being a teacher, I have to speak in the language of the audience I'm teaching, or I would need an interpreter, or I would have to be able to do the interpreting myself, okay? To, and use it as a teaching tool to bring forth the name of God. But He is our Father, our Heavenly Father. And uh, we have in his name, in the Hebrew manuscripts, he has many names that people are not familiar with even, that are a blessing to know and to understand. You with Strong's Concordances, if you go to about 3040 in the Hebrew manuscripts, 30, uh, 40, 35, somewhere along in there, it will start with Yahweh, but then it will come and it will say, Yahweh Jari. Well, what does Yahweh Jari mean? Well, it's his name and a title. Being interpreted, it means Yahweh the provider. So when you pray for something to provide you with, it does not harm you to pray to Yahweh Jari that, that, uh, pr the, that provides for you. So you see, uh, it's all in the name, but also we have many languages in this world. This is why the beauty that happened on Pentecost Day was not a foreign, unknown tongue, but the Holy Spirit spoke and everybody understood it. It didn't need an interpreter because God can speak in every language all at the same time. Whereby, I don't care if you're in China, Japan, Russia, uh, Europe or America or Africa, you're going to understand the perfect tongue. You need no translator. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. You can read that in Acts chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Was not unknown, just the opposite. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nancy from New Hampshire. If Satan is in heaven with Jesus, 
on the good side of the gulf, how come Satan is allowed to be there? He's supposed to be in a place, uh, is he supposed to be in a place of holiness? I thought those who commit sins have to go to the opposite side. <clears throat> he is behind. That's the opposite side. He's, uh, he's controlled. He is allowed, though, to tempt the weak because that's what this earth age is about. God sent the word whereby everybody can absorb the truth unless God has blinded them and to be able to take care of themselves, to love God on their own, their own free will and to choose to love God or you could love Satan. That's what he wants to know which you're going to choose because we have an eternity coming and we don't, any, we don't want anyone around us that can be deceived into worshiping Satan after they are in a spiritual body and absolutely know better. I say that for the, the fact of the fact that much teaching will be done in the millennium when all will be in spiritual bodies without hangups from the flesh. Sue from Mount Oklahoma. I love to study with you. Well, it's good to have you with us. I'm learning a lot. Good. Uh, please thank your staff. We do. We have a good staff. My question or in Judges 9.21, the word beer, uh, what does it mean here? In what area is it located? And thank you so much. Well, it, that was, you would have found it in Judges, but the correct pronunciation in the Hebrew is bar, bar. And it, it's bir, it means a well, okay. And that's, that's what wells were called. We, in English, a well, in Hebrew, bir, okay. Um, this is why one religion known as the Birians, it means well watered. That's what their name means in the Hebrew tongue. Uh, Pamela from Texas, tithing, is it the Lord's law that you have to give 10% of your earnings from the top of your income, or how does this work? And if it is what God says to do, give 10% from your earnings, what if you're self-employed and taxes are eating you alive? Also eating us alive are more expenses and cost of living, medical food and medicine. I give $100 or more when I can, but, at the, but some preachers say that if you don't give 10%, that you will not enter heaven. It's robbing God. What is the real answer? <clears throat> well, you, you need to be a good mathematician, okay? <clears throat> if you're in business for yourself and you bring in a million dollars, and after you pay your employees and all the the uh, material it took to produce whatever your profession is, it cost you a million dollars to accomplish all that, to take care of your employees. What do you have left? You have zero. So what is 10% of zero? 10% of zero is zero, so you gave 10%. Don't let some preacher tell you, you know, if you've got a wagon and you're selling apples, if some preacher comes along and takes your wagon and all the apples, he puts you out of business. So if he tells you you have to pay 10% off the top, you're not, that's not profit, and it's not your money. It belongs to your employees. It belongs to the merchandise, merchandising you're buying to produce your product and that costs money, they have to be paid. What was your profit? Zero. So, um, and that's, that's as if when somebody's out of work. What is 10% of their income? Zero. Okay. So don't let some preacher take advantage, and I especially don't like ministers that take advantage of senior citizens on fixed incomes that can even hardly get by. A love offering is a beautiful thing. That's what you're doing, and God recognizes that, and that's beautiful. Uh, Mark from Michigan, what are the two flag pins on your lapel? Are you a 5013C nonprofit organization? Uh, yes, uh, every church, uh, basically, most churches are. 
And uh, that's the gift of God for this great nation and our freedoms here. The flags on my lapel is the great American flag and the flag of the United States Marine Corps, of which I am a Marine. Once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. And, um, and I wear it proudly because I love my nation and I, I love the Corps. I love the people in it and how fantastic it is. I, I love all people, basically. And a lot of them need correcting. We can get that done also. Jimmy from Ohio. Is it okay to start warning people that the Antichrist is coming first? When should I st stop and let the Holy Spirit speak through me? When you're delivered up. Uh, naturally, planting seeds is a wonderful thing, but don't ever overload people's donkey, all right? You can, you can drive them away by too much information. When you fish, you toss a little bait out there and you just jiggle it around until you feel them hit it and then sink the hook, but don't, don't uh, sink the hook until you get them on it, okay? Virginia from South Carolina. People explain to me why you say Satan is, please rather explain to me why you say Satan is of the moon and God is of the sun. I know God is of the light, but I don't understand where you get that from. Thank you. See, you're not listening real good. You, you missed the whole point. The statement would have been all prophecy concerning Satan is, of, is given in moons. That means months in, in, being translated into English. Example, in, in Revelation chapter 13, Satan has 42 months. That's three and a half years. The, the, the two witnesses have 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. So, it, but it's given in days, solar, sun, light. All prophecies concerning God's election are given in days, so, solar. And Satan, any prophecy given concerning him is in moons, months. So you see, it's not sun and moon, it's, it's the months and days, uh, all right? The prophecy, that, that helps you determine whether a pro prophecy is concerns um, wickedness, Satan, or whether it concerns God's children very effective and and interesting uh, tony and sean from colorado you state that satan will say i'm here to rapture everybody out of here it makes perfectly good sense however i don't seem to find this uh, in my bible please help well what does mark 13 say concerning brother mother shall betray daughter to death and father betray son to death. What would cause a mother, you, you know Christian women, a Christian woman will die for her kids. What in the world would cause her to deliver her child up to the Antichrist? Here within lies your answer. She thinks it's Jesus. His message is, is bring them in. I'm a good old boy. I'm going to save them. And we will take them right on out of here. We'll raise them to a higher level of thinking. In other words, he's pretending to be Christ. And the mother will deliver when the child says, Mama, that is not Jesus. That's Antichrist. She'll say, my daughter's a good girl. I've raised her good. Please be patient with her and, and convert her to your way of thinking which is rapture, okay? So there you have it. That's Satan's message. And you know something? Nothing else. Uh, that will, to change, uh, if a mother is convinced that is the Lord Jesus Christ, she would do anything to have him help her child. The only problem is that she's ignorant. She doesn't know, I'm not saying that disrespectfully, she's ignorant of the truth. She will think it's Christ and she will turn you into him. But that's good. That's biblical. That's when you're delivered up and Christ speaks through you and we, we, um, we take care of his boat. A Bernard from Alabama. I've been told in John chapter 17 that when Jesus prayed, Father, I pray that you not take them out of this world, 
but you, but you protect them from the evil one, that this is talking about the disciples when I believe that this is speaking about all Jesus believers, then um, them and then to come. And you're right, because he's talking about his elect. He's talking about those that do know better. He said, I'm, I've given them the message that Satan comes first. I've, I've taught them the difference between right and wrong. And I don't want you to take them. He knew he was leaving the earth uh, other than through uh, the comforter. And he knew he had to leave the children here because we've got work to do. And we can flat get her done, all right? That's what, and, and do it happily. We get that word spread and we do it by being here until our job is finished and then we also will be with him if, if it precedes the time that he returns with the false one. We'll take care of business all the way through. Wanda from Alabama, who are the 24 elders spoken of? Well, nobody knows absolute, but um, um, probably a learned, um, a, a scholarly guess would be the 12 disciples and the 12 patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel would be the 24 elders. That is assumed by many scholars. Okay, I, and I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. It's the letter He sent to you. And when you open it and absorb it, it makes His day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.